Can you share with us your journey into the world of Sanskrit studies? What initially drew you into this ancient language and its literature? Well, initially, uh, I had been introduced to Sanskrit when I learned the practice of transcendental meditation. That was when I was 15 years old. And so I always had then a curiosity about where that tradition of transcendental meditation came from, uh, because it had been taught by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, who was a student of the Shankaracharya of the North, Swami Brahmananda Saraswati. And there's a puja recited when we're taught. So it, it, that puja is recited in Sanskrit. So that was my first introduction to it. And uh, then I, I got interested in reading the Upanishads. And when I was in college, I was interested in studying ancient language. I started studying ancient Greek and the philosophy of the ancient Greeks. That was my, my major in college. But there wasn't the opportunity to learn Sanskrit at that time. And I, I, I only started studying Sanskrit after college in uh, graduate school at Brown University. When uh, I, I thought that I would study the classics and I had to take an intensive course in Latin in New York City to catch up on, on Latin. And when I was taking that course, I decided I really was not interested in reading uh, Latin poetry. I was more interested in the philosophy. And uh, so when I went up to, to Brown to join the classics program, classics program there, I asked the department chair, can I substitute Sanskrit for, for Latin and do Greek and Greek and Sanskrit? And he said, no because we need to train you for jobs. And if you get a PhD from a classics department, then they expect you to be able to teach Latin and Greek. And I said, well, I don't have time. And, and so I didn't want to wait three years of going through the, the regular classics Latin and Greek program before I could start studying Sanskrit. So uh, I just uh, took up Sanskrit and then applied to the University of Pennsylvania uh, where I where I could study just Sanskrit. Amazing, thank you. And how did you bring the computational aspect into the Sanskrit language? Like, what was the beginning of that journey? And can you just talk yeah. a bit about computational linguistics in Sanskrit and why um, this subject has developed so beautifully? So uh, while I was in college, a friend of mine had advised me that you're, you're not going to get a job if you major in philosophy and you'd better learn some computer science. So I, I took some summer courses in, in computer science and afterwards started working for that friend's company for a, a few months. And then I, I had a, a job in uh, Stanford, Connecticut with a, a company there uh, as a computer consultant. So I worked for a year there before I went up to Brown. And when I went when I was at Brown, I had a part-time job, two part-time jobs actually, one for the chair of the classics department and one for a linguist uh, uh, where, uh, where I started learning linguistic applications of, of computing. So when I was in college, uh, when I was in graduate school rather, I, I put all of that aside uh, while I was studying Sanskrit, but Afterwards, uh, Professor Cardona had a project to create a database of Sanskrit grammatical texts. And this included the Ashtadhyayi, the Siddhanta, the, the Ashtadhyayi, the Kashika, and the Mahabhashya. And, uh, and I was responsible for analyzing the Ashtadhyayi, creating a database. And in the process of that, I wrote a program to do Sunday, to implement Sunday according to Panamian rules, including all of the options. And, uh, and we used that to recreate the original from our Sunday, an Sunday analyzed source. So that was the beginning of my um, combination of Sanskrit and, uh, and computational methods. And then while I was at Brown, uh, I. I was paid a visit by Gerard Duet, who, whom you know, who is also a participant in, in this conference. Uh, and he was, he was interested in, 
in the work that I was doing, uh, particularly on Ramo Bakhyana. And, uh, and so uh, I, I had com completely a detailed formalization of, of the Ramo Bakhyana and analysis of it on many different levels, which is published in my uh, Ramo Bakhyana reader. Uh, and I just made a second edition of that now. And um, I had a web application at that time that that presented the uh, the analysis in in several steps. So one could one could look at the verse, then one could choose to see it in romanization. One could look at the analyzed Sunday. One could look at notes that I had written on it, prose sentences that I had written, and English translation. And we could we could show or hide these things, and and then also uh, click on any word to get its morphological analysis and uh, lexical connection, and then click on the lexical connection to connect it to uh, a dictionary. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I had had worked with a. Uh, who was somebody who was then a graduate student in the classics department and very experienced with the contemporary digital humanities world. He had worked with the Perseus project. And so together we were, were working to create a Perseus for Sanskrit. And that's what started the Sanskrit library, uh, which you see behind me on the virtual image here. Uh, so in 2002, uh, I founded the Sanskrit library and we created a project with, uh, with the Titus project, which then had the largest collection of Sanskrit texts as part of their, their Indo-European collection. And there were some 81 texts. And so we took their texts together with a the digital version of the dictionary of Monia Williams that was created by Thomas Malton at the University of Cologne. And we wrote software in two steps. I wrote this, sorry, an XML representation of the Pananian rules uh, to, to decline and conjugate nouns and nominals and verbs so that we could create a what we called a full form lexicon uh, of all of the grammatical forms of all of the nominals and verbal forms. And we used the Monia Williams dictionary as the base for that and conjugated and declined all of the forms in that dictionary to create a, uh, a way of mapping the declined forms to the dictionary. And we then reversed that, that um, automatic declension and conjugation software to create a morphological analyzer. And so Gerard Huet was then visiting uh, MIT and uh, Harvard, and uh, he, he, he visited Michael Bitzel at Harvard. And, uh, and then he came down to Brown to, to visit me and, and invited me to the uh, seminar he was uh, holding in Paris, which turned out to be the first Sanskrit computational linguistic symposium. So at that at that event, which was not then called that, uh, he, Ambakul Karni, and I uh, founded the Sanskrit Computational Linguistics Consortium. And then I had I had funding at that time in the project I just described. Uh, so I held the second uh, symposium a year later. And Amba Kukarni held the third, and we published the papers in the in in the Springer um, uh, natural language natural language computation series. So that's that's that started that started the Sanskrit Computational Linguistics Symposium. Wonderful, and you touched upon Panini. I know it's something you've worked a lot with. Um, I believe also you were a student of George Cardona. Um, I think he's That's right. one of the greatest Western Paninian um, scholars, if not the greatest. And how, because often it's it's paralleled with computation. Panini, the 
thought processes, the iterative approach and the functional approach of the grammar of the sort of de de derivations. Can you just speak briefly about that and also what projects that inspired you to do based on Panini? It's a bit of an enigma for Western scholars because um, it's usually learned, uh, you know, as a specialized subject, but um, I know that you've gone very deeply into it. I'd love you to just chat about that. Yeah, so Panini and grammar is a derivational morphology. Uh, it's, a, it's a process of derivational morphology, but it takes into account the semantics at first and the syntax also to some extent. And so it, uh, it creates the word forms on the basis of semantic and syntactic conditions. And this, this approach uh, actually inspired Chomsky to create his uh, analysis of the English language using a, uh, a cascade of rules to account for forms. Prior, prior to that, uh, in the West, uh, structuralism had analyzed uh, language into units, strictly looking at contiguous uh, um, morphemes and uh, and to account for something more complicated like uh, uh, non what's called non contiguous morphology where you have uh, we have elements that are related to each other but either overlapping or or separated uh, it requires a, a different approach and the original uh, contribution of Chomsky was a transformational grammar, which, which took one kind of speech form as fundamental and transformed it into another, taking an active sentence, for example, as fundamental and transforming it into a passive. The approach of Panini is different. And, and that you know, later uh, X-bar grammar came to, to look more deeply at, at uh, a more Paninian approach, okay? But the Paninian approach is to start with the semantics, to go fundamentally to the deepest level of language, which is not the expressed speech form. You know, the grammatical tradition in India recognizes four levels of speech. The, you know, ab the Shabda Brahman, the absolute pure consciousness, uh, and, and what's called Pashanti uh, kind of uh, insight, where you have a single uh, gestalt of an idea. And, uh, and it's not, uh, it's not, expressed in any kind of linear uh, form. And then the Madhyama Vak, the middle level of speech, which is our discursive thought. And at that stage, one has, uh, a, uh, has speech forms in mind. And one has a sequence of speech forms, but one uh, cognizes those speech forms as whole units then the, the, the most expressed level of speech is the vaikari, where, where the, you just have uh, acoustic sounds, one following the other. And, uh, and there's no, there's no actual, there is no actual connection between the acoustic value of the language and the cognition of the units of the speech, which is a mental phenomenon. So Paninian grammar takes the approach of opposite to what the Western grammarians do. The Western grammarians, you know, after structuralism, there was descriptive grammar where you're looking at this, the language first, you're looking at the expressed form of speech and you're trying to understand it. So you're breaking it up into pieces and uh, trying to figure out the relationships and so forth. So you're starting from the, the phonetic value and you're diving, trying to dive deeper into the understanding level, into the meaning level. But because of the pressure of of uh, uh, the sort of materialistic science and uh, empiricism in the early 20th century and the middle 20th century, uh, it was very difficult for the linguists to um, take, a, take a pure Paninian approach because they don't wanna recognize that there is anything mental, right? It's only it's only the sense data that is, that are considered real and um, criterion for scientific study. So the the American 
descriptive linguists were working with just describing the phenomenon as they are. And Chomsky started to take a dive inward, uh, looking at the grammatical structures as real entities, as real structures of our, our mental functioning, a faculty of knowledge. But the Paninian approach doesn't start from the outside and go inward. It starts from the inside and goes outward. So it starts from the meanings, the semantics, and then it introduces speech forms on the basis of those semantic and syntactic conditions, and then uh, co-occurrence conditions, and then uh, uh, introduces the speech units, and then polishes the relationship between the phonetic uh, representations of those speech forms between the morphemes to create the uh, the, the words as they're actually used and actually actually appear in the language. So, so that uh, approach actually, I, I undertook a project to after, after doing that um, project with the, the Sunday, uh, implementing Sunday rules and implementing uh, nominal and, and verbal der uh, inflection, to create that, I, I hunted through the grammar and picked out rules for the various purposes I need them, needed them. And there were you know, many mistakes and many refinements that were needed. And at one point I said, I don't wanna hunt through the grammar to justify the results anymore. I'm gonna start with the grammar as it's given and formalize the entire thing. And so I undertook a project with the help of uh, uh, Anuja and Tanuja Ajotikar, who are also uh, Vayakaranese, they're uh, experts in grammar. And uh, we formalized the entire Ashtadhyayi in, in an XML formalization. And uh, we are working on creating a computational implementation of that. It's a time consuming task. We've done little pieces of it. I've done some demonstration derivations, which are on our website this, at the Sanskrit library under derivations. Someone can look there. And, and it's very interesting to see how many steps are left out in, in explanations such as in the Siddhanta Komedi or Bala Manorama, which tries to go, tries to give a more or less complete derivation. But those derivations are actually uh, wildly incomplete. They're, they're leaving out many steps and they don't start from the beginning, okay? So the beginning is just semantic conditions. What, do, what is the meaning we wanna represent? And, and we start from there and categorize the meanings into, into the karakas and so forth, and then use those to introduce the speech forms and uh, proceed. So we, we worked out how to do it, but I haven't implemented it comp computationally yet. Well, I haven't had time but uh, I hope to get to it uh, Amazing. within a few months, actually. And uh, on that note, could you talk about the past, current, and future projects of, Sun of the Sanskrit Library um, and some of the things you're planning to, to release and to achieve? Yeah. So we extended the dictionary project. I, I wrote a, a grant proposals for the uh, German uh, Research Foundation uh, and the National Endowment for the Humanities to expand our dictionary holdings. So together, Cologne and, and the Sanskrit Library expanded our dictionary holdings to about 45 dictionaries, which are now all available. Many people have downloaded them and copy them and, uh, and unfortunately don't give uh, adequate credit to uh, where they got them. Uh, but it was Thomas Malton and I who created those dictionaries with a lot of help from volunteer help, I might mention, from Jim Funderburg. Uh, and um, that was that was one of our most important projects. And then the other was the others were uh, to uh, catalog the Sanskrit manuscripts and and align them with manuscript images. They had a project at Brown University and the University of Pennsylvania with a selected set of manuscripts on the Mahabharata. 
and then a, a project to catalog the entire collection at Harvard University. So we cataloged uh, about 2,000 manuscripts there. And we have a digital catalog of those manuscripts. Uh, and I, the, uh, the, let's say the first edition of that catalog has been online already for several years. Uh, and in the next few months, actually, I'm working to finalize that and, and also make a print version of it. So uh, future projects involve, uh, involve completing the computational implementation of the Pontinian grammar and then using the dic a, creating a dictionary from the forms created. Because if we create all the forms from semantics, and have that whole rule history, we can reverse that to, to show the, the meaning and the derivational history of every form, which itself is a dictionary, a purely Pontinian dictionary. And we'll use that as a basis to integrate all of the dictionaries. And once we integrate all of the dictionaries, uh, then what we hope to do is, is use that as the basis of a search engine to uh, analyze texts because we'll have we'll have the relationship between the forms as they appear in texts, even Sundeed, and uh, and uh, use that to find the matching forms and connect them with that dictionary. So that will create a, a way of of connecting texts with the linguistic analysis and and the dictionaries to allow um, what people have been trying to do for Sanskrit for a long time now uh, in partial ways uh, to make a, a, a really useful uh, online library of, of Sanskrit. Do you think the large language models and the current acceleration happening with neural networks and machine cognition can accelerate these goals? Down the line, they can, but at present, they can't because uh, we just don't have enough data. We don't we don't have enough data that aligns Sanskrit text with its analysis and interpretation. Um, there have been some people who have been creating a lot of that data, particularly uh, 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 I'm sorry, his name is Oliver, Oliver Helwig. Uh, Oliver Helwig. Oliver yeah, Helwig. Yeah, yeah. Yes. He, he's right. he's done a fantastic job of creating a lot of data. Uh, and we had projects in conjunction with uh, Gerard Huet to, to try to create some of that data. We did create some, but it's not a significant amount. It's not a, nearly enough to be uh, useful for, um, for artificial intelligence methods. But, uh, but we, we hope to get there, we'll get there. I, I've experienced um, people working on projects to try to use uh, contemporary computational methods to analyze Sanskrit. And uh, I saw such a project at Brown University, someone in the computer science department. And the, the professor who was advisor said, well, he did, a, he, did a great, he did a great job on the computational side. But if you looked at the results that it achieved for Sanskrit, it was just total garbage. Right. So, that was my that has formed my impressions most firmly that we're just not ready. Uh, we need more we need more data. He didn't have the right data to to work on. So uh, uh, it, it's nine thirty here. Do you have time for another question, or do you have to dash for the class? Let's let's make it one brief question, then I've then I've got a class yeah. starting. Uh, actually, in two thousand fifteen, at, I met you in Bangkok, and you spoke about the magnitude of Sanskrit literature and this incredible. Um, a corpus of manuscripts, some extent, some not. Um, I mean, some ex existing still in, in manuscript form. Uh, what are the and not attempts... edited, not yet critically edited. Yeah, not edited. Yeah. yeah, what what what's happening? I mean, firstly, could you comment on the magnitude of Sanskrit in comparison to other languages um, pre the printing yeah. press? Of course, so, and... so sense, yeah. Sanskrit has been the language of learning of of scholarly exchange in India for for at least three and a half millennia. 
which is a huge expanse of time uninterrupted. And this is unmatched anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, we've, we've got other languages that have uh, had the role of being a sort of lingua franca, as it's called, named after when French was such a language in the 17th century. And, and English is, be is becoming that language now where uh, all of the scientific work, all of the um, literary work, uh, research, if one wants it to have the widest readership, has to be in that language. Well, Sanskrit was that language in, in South Asia. It spread over Southeast Asia and with Buddhism into China and Japan, Korea, uh, throughout Southeast Asia and uh, you know, Sri Lanka. And, uh, and so its, it's, it's breadth and, and scope was enormous and uninterrupted. So, you know, the so-called dark ages in Europe uh, limited, limited the quality of research for, for, for centuries where such a period never happened in India. And while, while Prakrit evolved from uh, earlier Sanskrit, and then, and then broke up into regional languages. You know, Prakrit was a lingua franca for a short period of time in the Ashokan Empire, but as time went on, those the the regions, the regional languages diversified, and it lost its lingua franca status. But Sanskrit was then turned to again as the language common to all areas of Sanskrit for scientific expression. So there's an enormous body of 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 work in, in Sanskrit. And I, I would say it's the largest body of literature in the world prior to the invention of the printing press. There, there were estimated to be by uh, David Pingree, who was an, an avid uh, book collector and manuscript collector and worked uh, ex uh, exhaustively on, on the Jyotish Shastra, the manuscripts of mathematics and astronomy and astrology, and created the census of the exact sciences in Sanskrit in five volumes, the sixth of which still has to be published. The, uh, he estimated that the extent of Sanskrit manuscripts was in the order of about 30 million. The uh, National Mission for Manuscripts in, in India since since then began uh, its census of the manuscripts held by all the manuscript libraries in India, they've already enumerated about 12 million. So, so it's probably not far off from uh, what P Pingree's estimate was if we can um, save those manuscripts before they become extinct, before, before uh, overly enthous enthusiastic religious People uh, throw them in the Ganges as offerings, or uh, or when they when uh, the descendants of some Sanskrit scholar who are not Sanskritists find some paper on a shelf and start using it for fuel or wrapping vegetables in, uh, the, then those uh, those manuscripts are destroyed. So there's a, a race against time to to digitize all those manuscripts. And uh, and then there's another project I, which I've discussed with you previously. The the uh, the project undertaken at uh, at uh, uh, in uh, in Madras in Chennai. Uh, new, new catalogus catalogorum. Most recently, the new the new catalog catalogorum most recently under the editorship of uh, uh, Das. Uh, and uh, and it published some forty created some forty two volumes of uh, the a catalog of catalogs that is a, a listing of all the manuscripts in all of the catalogs uh, of India and elsewhere in the world. Although its scope may not have included all of the catalogs, but it but it's the it's the greatest detailing of the works and authors of Sanskrit literature that's ever been done. And uh, it's extremely important to, to give people an accurate idea of what literature there is in Sanskrit. It's a knowledge map of 
of the production of literature over those three and a half millennia. And to, to utilize that to its full extent is also a, an extremely important project. And I know I've talked with you about, about that before and you've undertaken quite a bit of work in that direction yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, so we, hope that, we, hope that, we hope that gets completed and, and that we can use that knowledge map to connect with all of the original catalogs that it catalogs and, uh, and use those catalogs then to extend <clears throat> an integration of the manuscripts and published works and editions of those works to make a, a, uh, a knowledge map that extends all the way down to the individual text. And that of course is an enormous project that will take uh, decades to achieve. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. And these Michelle. are the, these are the project these are the projects that that involve digital humanities work, and I, it is my hope that the Sanskrit Computational Linguistics Symposia will pay attention to these kinds of projects, uh, and not just focus on on uh, copying the kind of work which is being done for. English and modern Western languages, you know, artificial attention to artificial intelligence and so forth, which right now are, are just gimmicks that don't really help us with these projects uh, in the Sanskrit, Sanskrit world. But this is why we created the Sanskrit Computational Linguistics Symposium. It's for, it's for doing computational work on the, the enormous body of Sanskrit literature. And the, the Sanskrit library has started offering a program in, in digital humanities that will, that will train more students. Uh, we had hoped to have a workshop there to, to involve some more students. And maybe we can do that in the future that uh, will, We'd love will to. train more uh, young Sanskrit scholars to We'd love, we'd in, love to in host digital that. methods. Yeah, we'll talk about that. In we'll future. talk about that. Thank you so much for the magnificent interview. I'm going to stop the recording now.